Now I would like to, um, to invite for the next session on uh, designing cyber safe medical system. I would like to invite Nancy Bra Brainerd, uh, Senior Director and Deputy CISO Global Security Office at Medtronic. Hi. All right, I have five minutes left to say good morning. Um, so happy to be here and happy to be a part of this uh, event um, and talking about um, medical device security and how we do that um, at Medtronic. So just a quick introduction. Um, Nancy Brainerd, I've been at Medtronic for uh, just over 23 years. Um, I've seen a lot of change in that time, obviously, as we all have, that uh, those of us that have been on the cybersecurity journey. Um, for those that are not familiar, Medtronic is the largest medical device manufacturing company in the world. And the way we entered the market over 60 years ago was we, uh, our, our, our founder invented the first uh, battery-operated pacemaker. So that's kind of how we entered the market. Our portfolio is very broad, very, very expansive in terms of what we treat today. And we're not going to go into all that. Um, so I've worked in IT or cyber uh, for my entire career um, at Medtronic. And I've, like I said, I've, I've seen a lot. Um, security hasn't really always been taken that seriously, um, as those uh, a, a lot of you uh, know and, and have kind of experienced over your careers. Um, but our world changed in 2011 when one of our patients, our diabetes patients, got on stage at uh, Black Hat in Las Vegas and demonstrated that his glucose monitor was vulnerable to a cyber attack. That woke a lot of people up, and it was about time, right? So not just Medtronic, but also the industry really started to uh, dive deep into cybersecurity of medical devices. And there's been a lot of work, a lot of collaboration, a lot of regulation, a lot of things that have happened since then to kind of move the needle on cybersecurity of, of medical devices. And so that's what we are, we're going to focus on here uh, today. So let's just start with a simple definition of what medical, device, uh, medical devices are. And I'm not going to read this to you. I'll let you read it. Um, but what I really want you to take away is that medical devices are not just capital equipment or a pacemaker, okay? It's evolved, and we've all seen this, into cloud, software, mobile devices. So all the things that are now blending with IT security um, as well, we have to factor in from a medical device uh, security perspective. And so just to give you a little bit of context on how we organize um, information security or product security at Medtronic. It's really a three-legged stool. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is that better? Um, so it's really a three-legged stool when it comes to security at Medtronic. So we have our global security office, which I report into, and has responsibility primarily for the traditional kind of IT security um, functions and, and security of our uh, enterprise. Uh, we also have our product security office, which reports into corporate, our corporate quality team, and they have oversight to the um, device and product security uh, that happens at the um, business unit levels, okay? Then we also have our R&D teams, and I have some of my uh, colleagues here today with me as well. So they are the ones that are actually taking the, the guidance and, and creating the designs and implementing it into the products and devices that Medtronic sells. So just, to, just by way of example, you can see our worlds are blended. And we spend a lot of time working and collaborating with each other on making sure that um, security is accounted for across all specters of, of our business. So what is our model for secure um, uh, security and privacy by design of our products? So med device generally follows the same general principles as traditional IT security um, during the development phase. So starting off with, with threat modeling and understanding um, kind of and defining the threat landscape uh, for the device as it will be in, uh, in its kind of therapeutic ecosystem, so to speak. So uh, this then will define the security requirements that are going to be built into the device. Secondly, once it's designed, um, we then... It has to be either or. No, this one is not working well. Let me, let me put this on the please. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I called the bad guy. That one was better. This one? Can you turn this off? Let me turn this. There you go. Okay. That's all right. It's okay. These people could get their money back? No, I'm just kidding. All right. So once we once we have the design finalized, um, you know, and we have the requirements to find the security requirements, um, we test it. We test the efficacy of those security controls either um, through various means. So the primary mean would be like full scope um, white box penetration testing. Okay, so that's the primary way that the security controls are tested of our devices. Um, but there's also things we do like code reviews um, and other things. You know, very traditional kind of DevOps type testing to make sure that those controls. Are effective. So then once the product is on the market, it kind of enters this whole life cycle stage of uh, continuous vigilance. So medical devices have a long lifespan, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, sometimes by design, sometimes it's just the way it is. Um, but once they're on the market, um, they, they do tend to fall into having the same and, and similar challenges as traditional IT security um, with the, the need for continuous signal monitoring, vulnerability management, um, risk assessment processes, and, and patching. So we use various methods um, to kind of gather ongoing and continuous security signals um, to identify emerging threats that are out there to our devices. So first of all, we um, have been in uh, compliance with the FDA's requirements in the United States. Um, we are working um, uh, to just have a cr continuous creation and review of our S-bombs, um, so the software bill of materials that go along with the medical devices. Um, honestly, this is, this is so critical because there's, there's elements of uh, the devices that are not Medtronic made, right? And so we need to have appropriate visibility and understanding of what those elements are so that if something is announced, a, a vulnerability or whatever the case might be, if it's a Microsoft PAX, a Linux PAX, Log4j, whatever it might be, we will know kind of where in our portfolio those elements live. Um, secondly, we partner very closely with uh, the Security Researcher Committee or Community or the White Hats. Um, so we, we work with them. They're out there continuously trying to, you know, break our devices or hack into our devices or demonstrate to us different areas or flaws uh, where we can um, uh, spend some time and attention and make sure that we are uh, mitigating those properly. Um, and then lastly, uh, just heavy promotion of our coordinated disclosure process. So every medical device organization has to have a coordinated disclosure process. It's, it's available on our website for anybody to go in and report uh, a security vulnerability or a flaw or an issue that they want to be uh, that they want to report, and we take those very seriously. We put them through all of our processes, um, and we're reviewing that uh, constantly. So those signals, whether it's from a security researcher or um, a vulnerability that's announced out in the industry, um, we pass those through a process called the security and safety risk assessment process. It's a quality process, and all of our processes fall under our quality umbrellas um, across all of our different teams. Um, and so they're looking at the vulnerability, looking at risk, impact, likelihood, things like that, and determining, OK, does this require a patch or other some sort of mitigation um, to, to address it? So if it does require a patch, um, it goes through the same kind of security by design process that we already talked about in one of the previous slides. Um, and that's typically a slow process. There's a lot of regulatory oversight uh, to different either changes or updates uh, or whatever the case might be to a medical device. Um, so that process is typically slower than you would see like for a typical Microsoft patch um, or something like that. Um, but I think overall, um, just in general, I think better coordination with our customers um, is, is something that we as an industry are always going to have to be raising our game with. Um, coordinating on things like asset management, asset identification. I think I heard this in the previous discussion. Um, and, and just knowing what's out there, because devices are coming on and off hospital networks um, all the time. And it's really critical to understand what those are, where they are, what's operating, what's running on them, right? So um, the last thing I'll mention is that we are, 
like other uh, medical device manufacturers, working to formally publish our S-bombs um, so that our customers have real-time access to what's running on those devices and when a log4j or, or, or something else gets announced and so that they can quickly assess what they have in their environments and don't necessarily have to wait for a statement uh, from us. So that's the life cycle management aspect of it. And I just want to also mention a, a just quick, a quick brief uh, distinction uh, between security and safety risk, which is safety is, has been historically the way um, we've measured risk of, of medical devices. So as you all know, you're all security practitioners, we focus on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those are our, those are, those are our goals in life to make sure that those are protected. Product security has the same, but you add safety into it. So patient safety and efficacy along with those. So, so it's another dimension of what we have to protect from a, from a security perspective with a medical device. So this, this graphic is an abstraction uh, from the AMI TIR 57 document on uh, medical device security risk assessment. You can Google it. Um, it shows parallels but, but separate processes for risk management of medical devices. So the core differences are safety, um, you know, Primarily, safety is based on, on this notion of probability, you know, from traditional electrical and me mechanical disciplines. Um, applying the notion uh, of probability to, to securities is, is difficult, it's challenging, and we all see this every day. Um, so we're just continuously looking for ways to mitigate those nuances um, and arrive at a reasonable outcome. Okay, I'm sorry, this is the least exciting slide in the deck. Well, you might disagree. Um, but I think it's important. It's, it's a question that we get asked the most often. Um, how do we manage device life cycle? It's a challenge. I'm, I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. Um, it's very difficult to address because med devices are intended to be around for a long time, right? Um, and as we all see, operating systems of common things like Microsoft and Unix and Linux, they, they they definitely have a, a finite life cycle. So it's hard to marry those, those two things up. Um, what I will say is, as an industry, we, we finally have some agreement with some of our regulatory regulators and, and different industry partners on common terms and phrases and just starting to build out the guidelines for best practices around um, device life cycle management. So, most recently, um, actually in January of this year, the IMDRF published uh, principles and practices for cybersecurity of legacy devices. Um, and then also there is a uh, legacy device guidance document from the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council in the US as well. So there is guidance finally coming uh, for uh, both um, customers and manufacturers around device lifecycle management. Um, Additionally, the entire industry is, is then also now currently working to operationalize that guidance and how we put it into routine practice on a daily basis. So, I mean, as with anything in, in medical device, um, there's a lot of regulations uh, and regulatory stages and steps that we have to go through and address. Um, so the other thing is that those regulatory guidelines vary in every single country. So while a product might be ready to go to market in Israel, it might not be approved in 14 other countries. And so it's challenging from our perspective to make sure we're managing the rollout of that and also um, addressing if there's secure, legacy con security concerns that we need to mitigate um, in some of those other countries where it's not approved. So we also realize that a lot of customers don't have a lot of extra cash laying around to be continuously refreshing their equipment. Um, and so, again, in lieu of replacement, what, what other creative mitigations can we be coming up with in terms of mitigating the threat and the risk of those security vulnerabilities that might exist on those, on those medical devices um, instead of just automatically replacing the, the older vulnerable ones? From a regulatory perspective, um, you may be surprised to learn that uh, there are very few explicit security requirements within global regulatory laws. So oftentimes it's published in the form of guidance um, that has to be interpreted and applied. Um, that said, uh, the auditors and the regulators um, will audit 
against that guidance um, and, and kind of measure how a, an organization is doing in terms of um, following the guidance and making sure that their devices are secure. Um, I think from a, from a med device industry perspective, regardless of where you're based in the world, uh, the FDA has been considered kind of the thought leader um, uh, across the globe around setting standards and guidance for medical device uh, safety and security. Um, so most manufacturers will kind of focus on FDA guidelines as, as kind of the high bar um, and, and strive towards meeting those requirements knowing um, that we'll likely have uh, better success across the globe as well. So this, this particular graph over on the, on the right depicts a timeline of, of various white papers and, and guidance and different things. Um, I'm not, you can't read it, and I, it's really just meant to kind of illustrate there's a lot out there. Um, I think some of it is very, very good. I think some of it might have, needs to be updated. It's, it's, it's aged for sure. Um, but you can see how far back, you know, this problem has kind of been identified and, and needing some attention from an industry perspective. Um, and it also just goes to show it's really not as simple as, as applying something like an ISO 27001 standard or something IT security related to a medical device. It's not comparable. Like go back to what I said about CIA and safety. It's, those things are all relevant in terms of what needs to be factored in from a risk management perspective. Um, medical devices have a unique attack surface. Um, and so when we think about the traditional IT security controls, it's just, they're just not always appropriate. You can't put a password on an ICD device that somebody might need at a moment's notice or have encryption on something that would slow the processor down of a, of a pacemaker to that effect. So again, it's, it's what's appropriate, what's proportional, but still keeps that device and that patient safe. And again, just going back to how we kind of started off the conversation, all of what we do is, is really based, um, our designs are based on our threat models, um, and then the available guidance as well. And I'll end here, so no presentation is complete without talking about cloud. I did not mention anything about AI, I'll just, I'll just throw that out there. Um, but I, I do briefly want to um, touch on the intersection of med device and cloud. So we, we all know that cloud is really just somebody else's computer, right? It's nothing fancy, it's nothing special. It's just something you don't have direct control over, right? Um, so you gotta, you gotta manage that risk, you gotta um, understand kind of the risk that that data, uh, you know, what could happen to it and whatnot. Um, so it, it's, it's what we're seeing now from a medical device perspective is that they are generating data, and that data has value, it has relevance, it's important, not just for um, understanding the condition of the patient, but also the condition of the device, right? So um, that data is transmitted from the device that the person might have up to the cloud. Um, the patient can access it, the physician can access it, they can get real-time information about how that patient is doing, are they having any issues, do they need to be seen in the emergency room? Um, all kinds of data um, can be learned just from you know, the telemetry of, of, of a medical device. Um, but that, that data is also very important to us because it speaks to the performance of the device itself. Um, is that device operating as intended? Um, is there any sign that there could be fault or any sort of anomaly um, of a device failure? So again, um, I get cloud device, it's, again, it's all converging. Um, and, and the way we look at these things is, is kind of a blend depending on um, whether it's you know, IT security or, or device security. So pause there, ask for questions. Go ahead. According to your expert opinion, what do you think the top uh, challenges, three top challenges of IOMP for nowadays combining with AI and machine learning, or maybe it should be separated network or I don't know, internet uh, so the, the biggest challenges with, um, if I'm understanding you, with IoT um, and possibly how AI fits into that. So um, IoT in general, so I mean IoT is anything from a medical device to the devices that we have on our manufacturing floors to these security cameras to, to anything. So I think the challenge that we have there is that they, the legacy aspect of it and trying to keep them up to date because nothing stays the same and the attackers find out new ways to exploit them. Um, so I think we, as an industry, and not just in medical device, but 
in general, we have to start looking at these things differently and, and assume that we're always going to be able to patch or keep it current. Um, we we've somehow, some way, have to figure out a way to lock these things down so that they're only doing what they're intended to do and refusing at, to execute on any other like command that gets sent to them, um, whether it's malicious or, or accidental even. So um, I think that's we got to change that mindset a little bit. Um, network isolation, great concept. We do it where we can in our manufacturing environments and whatnot to keep them segmented. Um, but it's not always practical because they have to talk back to the mothership and, and exchange you know, telemetry data about how they're performing and it's, you know, it feeds into our quality systems to make sure we can track, you know, what device was, was produced here and when it was shipped here and all that. So um, that's not always practical either. So I think, um, I don't know if I came up with three, but those are definitely, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So the, the the turnaround it's getting faster. Um, it 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 hasn't historically been the greatest because we aren't always sure what we're dealing with, you know. So um, the turnaround is getting faster there. Um, I don't know if I have a specific example even to share about something being attacked. We just we haven't seen that. Uh, knock on wood. Um, but from a vulnerability announcement perspective, I mean, you can go out to Medtronic.com right now and you can see all of our security bulletins. So we do proactively publish. Uh, what's out there, what we plan to do about it, when a, if, if a fix is going to be released or not, and why, and blah, blah, blah. But we do proactively reach out to customers as well. Not directly to patients, because Medtronic's relationship is not with the patient, it's with the healthcare provider. So we work with them to make sure that they understand what's going on and that they can make the best decision for the patient based on the situation. Yeah, good question. Patching and this thing, and also the supply chain management one, that's bomb, that's the one word I saw. So how do you manage, because maybe you're using a lot of open source components in your device design, so with any vulnerability report in open source component, how you take up this patching, and, and, and this, how you track the supply chain management? Yeah, so, so the elements of, of a device or a piece of software that um, are not manufactured by Medtronic, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, Apache, or I'm making that up a little bit, but um, so that will be called out, like, um, and we have it. We have a repository internally where we keep um, all of the different. I'll call it the recipe of what each device is made of. Um, so we have the versioning, and so when announcements are made in the industry about, oh, Apache just announced a vulnerability of this, and then we scan and we see, oh, we have five instances of this across our device portfolio. You know, we'll make a de we'll make dis risk based decision about how uh, whether it can be exploited, whether it's a high risk or a low risk or whatever. Um, and then determine do we pull that patch from the vendor and apply it to our device, um, et cetera. And, it, and again, it would go through all of our same kind of quality controls, um, regulatory approvals and everything to just make sure that it didn't impact the device as it was intended to be operating. Yeah. 